Okay, and so we're going to go ahead. Oops, not chapter 5, but chapter 4. Uh, there's a few things from chapter 3, the classified balance sheet that we're still going to talk about. I stuck those slides here at the end of chapter 4. You'll find them posted on uh, B courses at the end of chapter 3. But I'll let you know when we get to that. Uh, we may probably won't get to that until after we go into, over the midterm anyway. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at uh, the chapter for material, and I have to remember to take it out of presenter view, or that's what you will see on the recording. Okay, so we take a look here, and uh, what we were dealing with is we sort of learned some of the basics, and we went into chapters one, two, and three. We were dealing with the notion of a service organization, right? And we talked about service revenue. So you provide the service, and you generate revenue from that. Well, what we're going to start to get into here in chapter four and then extend that into chapter five is what happens if you are a merchandising entity. So instead of sitting here and just providing service, now you're going to sell product. And you can see example of some of the you know obvious merchandising type organizations uh, there are out there. Okay. Now, when you are selling merchandise, you run into the situation that you're going to need con to consider what is the cost of the item that you have sold. So we have our sales, which was like our raw revenue that we talked about really in uh, the other chapters. But now we have to consider the cost of that product. So if we're a company like, I don't know, I always use Nordstrom in my examples here. We're a company like Nordstrom. What happens? You come in, you buy a shirt, but Nordstrom bought that inventory, that shirt from somebody else before they sold it to you, right? Nordstrom doesn't manufacture those things in the back room there and then bring them out on those fancy tables with the piano player and stuff to sell them to you. What? They are buying those already produced items and then they're selling to them to you. So in calculating our net income, we are first going to have to calculate our gross profit. Our gross profit is going to be whatever we sold the item for minus the cost of goods sold, the cost of what we sold you. So if we sell you something for $5, but we had to purchase it from a manufacturer for 2 then our gross profit on that is what is going to be three dollars in that example right okay now we will continue and we will report our operating expenses which is very similar to the type of expenses that we dealt with in our chapter two primarily example where we had our salary expense we had our utility expense all of those different things those are considered operating expenses and then the what the gross profit minus the operating expenses will be our net income. Now we're also going to talk tonight about something considered non-operating items, but for right now let's just consider our what our sales minus our cost of goods sold gives us what gross profit and then what and then we calculate our operating expenses or we report our operating expenses and the difference is going to be our net income. Okay, by the way, even though it says illustration 5.1, this is chapter 4 that we're talking about here. So don't get confused on that. These slide numbers, I don't use the same exact uh, slides as the book has them listed. I borrow them from other places, so don't worry about these fives. We're in chapter 4. Okay, all right. Now, we talk about something called operating cycle. And operating cycle is essentially how long it takes a business to turn its inventory into cash. So if you are a what? If you are a pure service in industry, you have a shorter operating cycle, obviously, because you don't have any inventory that you're going to have to first acquire that you can later on turn around and sell. You just what? Provide the service, you generate the revenue. If you start a CPA firm, you just sit there and hang up your CPA and start to provide services, right? If you are an, a, a merchandising company, you are first going to have to acquire the inventory that you can sell, right? And then when you get into merchandising entities, they have different operating cycles. So what do you think is longer? The operating cycle of a winery or the operating cycle of a sushi restaurant? The winery obviously has the longer operating cycle from vine to bottle, whatever, right? And I don't know much 
about the, you know, I know the consumer end of the wine <laughs> business, but I don't know much more about it than that. Uh, sushi restaurant, if it's much long, if it's more than what, a day or two, don't eat there, right? Okay. So uh, obviously, even in <laughs> merchandising, there are variations in what, in the length of the operating cycle. Okay. All right, good. Now, when we talk about our flow of costs for our inventory, we have our beginning inventory. That's what we start the year off with. So we have so many items in our inventory, we start the year with those. Then what? Then we go and we purchase additional items. You add what you started with plus what you purchased. That is considered goods available for sale. Isn't that true? You started with 20, you bought 50 more. How many do you have available for sale? 70, right? Of course, we would do these in dollar amounts, okay? And then what? Then we would go ahead and we would say, well, how many items do we have left at the end of the period? That's considered our ending inventory. So if I started the year out with, what I say, 20? Well, let's just do it right here. I started the year out with what? 100,000 worth? I bought what? 300, so I had available for sale 400,000. If I go and I count my inventory and I have 50,000 left, doesn't that mean that I sold 350,000? Right? Start the year with 100,000, bought what? Bought 300,000, we have goods available for sale. You subtract off the ending inventory that's left. That difference should be the cost of goods sold, and I like to throw in there or stoled because what? Maybe some of the stuff's not there anymore because someone stole it from us, right? Or maybe our own employees took it from us right under our nose. So you could call it what? Cost of goods sold or stole, but it ain't here anymore, right? And so that means uh, that we would report that off of our sales and that would be the calculation of our gross profit. Now, when we look, um, we can record our inventory under one of two systems, perpetual or periodic, okay? What's described here, this little calculation that I kind of scribbled in here on this slide, is really the periodic system. With the periodic system, we do not know how many items we have in our inventory until the end of the year. We literally have to count our inventory at year end to know what our ending inventory is. Okay? So what happens? You have your beginning inventory, you add your purchases for the year, that gives us what? Goods available for sale. And then we literally have to go and count our ending inventory to see what we have. We subtract off our ending inventory and that's how we back into what our cost of goods sold is. So we don't know our ending inventory or our cost of goods sold, nor our cost of goods sold until we do what? Until we actually go and count our ending inventory. Is this a very good system? No. It's not that great because what? We could be sitting here all day going, okay, yeah, I think we have items in ending inventory. And when we finally look, it's all gone, isn't it? And it could have been what? It could have been stolen. So this stoled, stolen, stole. Okay. <laughs> cut, the English cut. Is it really stolen or stolen? Okay. So what happens? What uh, we do, it's a poor internal control. So what we really should be doing is what? Having some means of keeping track of our inventory as we go along, right? So most companies don't use this system anymore. What most companies will do these days is they will use what? God created computers so that we have those little barcodes on there. And when we buy an inventory mm -hmm. item, we simply do what? Swipe it. We know what's in our inventory. And then each time we add it to our inventory, each time we purchase, and then each time we sell an item, we do what? We subtract it out of our inventory and account for our cost of goods sold. That is considered the perpetual system. And that's what most companies use these days. Most companies will use a perpetual system, which is what we're going to talk about here in a couple of minutes. So then it begs the question, well, John, if that's the case, why are you even telling us about the periodic method and you're telling us, you know, making us jump through obsolete hoops over here? Well, if you are looking at the CPA exam in the future, CPA exam loves to run you through this periodic method because they want to see if you understand that what? And you have to sort of know it like a Catholic priest, I always say, which is what? 
Beginning inventory plus purchases equal goods available for sale minus ending inventory equals cost of goods sold. You can't sit there and I don't understand how this thing works. You've got to know because on the exam, they're saying, look, you CPA, if you had a client who had a problem, there was a fire or something and they didn't know what their beginning inventory was, you would have to do what? you would have to work through the records to help them to figure out what their beginning inventory must have been. And so on CPA exam questions, they won't give you the beginning inventory. They'll just simply say, well, their sales were this up to the time of the fire. And they may even tell you what the beginning inventory was. They'll tell you what their purchases were, but they'll say they don't know what the ending inventory was because of this fire. Could you help them calculate what their ending inventory was? And you should be able to, they got maybe destroyed in the fire, and you should be able to by what? Well, if I know the beginning, I know the purchases, I don't know ending, but I can, I can know what they sold before the fire, so I can work my, back, my way back up to see what the what ending inventory must have been, right? Okay, so this is why we still talk about the periodic system. This is why we still need you to understand this uh, calculation of cost of goods sold using periodic, okay? Under the perpetual system, what do we do? We will update our inventory records after each purchase of inventory, and then after each sale of inventory, we will go ahead and record our cost of goods sold, okay? So major difference between the two systems, which one gets used the most? Perpetual system, periodic, not so much, but you're still going to have to understand it, okay? Okay, good. Uh, so we talk about advantages, and this is why most companies use it now. I mean, the main reason most companies use it is the computerized systems with the barcodes and stuff make it very cost-efficient method to use, and it does what? It allows us to keep track of our inventory items, particularly if they are high-value items, say a vehicle, right? If you ever go to buy a vehicle, buy a new car or something, and they sit there and they'll say, oh, we'll look and see if we have the model you want and the color you want and all that, and they make you wait. That's simply a marketing ploy on their part. They know exactly what they have in inventory down to the, you know, tire size of one of the cars or whatever, down to every little detail of those cars because they're high ticket items, right? So they keep track of all that perpetual. So it is a way to keep track of that. Um, also, it shows the quantity and cost of the inventory that should be on hand at any time. So what happens? If you're a company and you're worried that maybe your employees are stealing your inventory or something, what could you do? You would have a listing of where items are, how, where, you know, how many of the items you have, and at any point in time, you could do a surprise inventory count and say, okay, we want to come to warehouse number 37 and we're going to count our inventory items to see that they're all still there. So it provides an additional internal control over the inventory. So better control than the periodic system where we don't really know what's in our inventory until we do some sort of year-end count. And by then, much of it could be stolen and the person that stole most of it could have already quit the company or something at that point in time, right? So periodic is going to, uh, excuse me, perpetual is going to give us a much better control than periodic. Okay, now what we're going to do is go through and look at some transactions here and we're going to look at the journal entries associated with these transactions. Are journal entries important? We don't do anything without journal entries, right? Nothing happens without journal entries. So we have this situation where we, per oh, by the way, we're using the perpetual method for this example. The examples in the slides our perpetual method a little bit later we're going to do an in-class example together and I'm going to have you do both perpetual and the periodic method in those examples that we're going to look at here in a little while we're going to look at the journal entries associated with them as well right so we've got this uh, stout stereo and they purchased uh, some inventory and uh, they make the following journal entry when they purchase the inventory is inventory an asset it has future economic benefits, so I'm going to debit the inventory, $3,800. i am going to credit the accounts payup bill. Is that a liability? Yeah. Credit the accounts payable because I have to pay these guys a little bit later, right? How do I know that this is perpetual method? Because they debited inventory, didn't they? Okay. If this was the periodic method, 
they would have simply debited purchases because we don't keep track of our inventory until what? Until year end when we actually count it, right? Okay, okay, good. So now what? Now we go ahead and we talk about freight costs. Does it cost to ship goods to your store so that you can sell them? Yes. Right, someone's not gonna, they're, they're not, well, they might deliver them for free, but they might make you pay the freight, okay? So what happens? If the terms are, you gotta get used to this term, guys, FOB shipping point. If it's FOB shipping point, that means the buyer of the inventory pays the freight. That means that the buyer of the inventory arranged for this guy to go to the vendor and pick this up. Who's this guy? Who hired this guy? Buyer. The buyer hired this guy. And he goes to the uh, vendor and picks up the inventory, right? Now, it's important, guys. Just the theory I have. I'm pretty sure that this stuff makes more sense with your eyes opened while you're watching it, okay? Um, you know, I know that I have a voice that was made for radio. I mean, a face that was made for radio. But uh, you want to keep your eyes open because I have a feeling that you'll understand it better if you use both the visual and the audio. Okay? Just the thought I have. The other concern is it's not very respectful for your sleep to your sleep to sleep during it. Just think about it. You're having a nice dream. You're going down, you know, a stream somewhere in a beautiful boat, and you're almost there. And there's a beautiful person on the other side of the boat. Meanwhile, there's some guy on the shore yelling, "Now, free on board shipping point!" Means and that ruins the dream for you. Right? So just hang on, okay? And wait for the save that dream for later. Okay. So what happens? We're sitting here, and we have free on board uh, shipping point. This guy was hired by who? by the buyer, okay? So what happens? If the buyer plays the freight cost, then the freight cost is going to be part of our inventory cost. In accounting, write this down, any cost that you pay to get an asset to your business so that you can start to use it is part of the cost of that asset. Who paid the freight here? The buyer, the buyer paid the freight and what? The buyer can't sell it to you if you don't if it's not at the store, can he? Can the buyer sell it to you if it's not at his store? Yeah, I mean, forget about Amazon. Okay, if it's not sitting there on you know in Nordstrom's store, you're not going to pay you know fifty nine ninety nine for a shirt because you didn't hear the piano player, right? So it, it gives it, uh, Nordstrom utility for that stuff to be at their store, right? So any amount you pay to bring an asset to your premises for your business so that you can use that inventory correctly, yeah, that asset correctly is part of the cost of that asset. So when the buyer pays the inventory, it is part of the cost, uh, pays the freight, I should say, it's part of the cost of the inventory, isn't it? And it'll be added, okay? Now, we call that freight in. We call that freight in, okay? Now, free onboard shipping point when does the title transfer to the buyer with free onboard shipping point? And title transfers to the buyer as soon as what? As soon as this guy comes and picks it up from the seller and puts it on the truck. Title transfers to the buyer as soon as this guy who the buyer hired comes and puts the goods on the truck, right? So what happens? If they come and they pick up the goods at December 28th, December 28th, and the goods don't arrive to the buyer's store until January 3rd, should that item be considered part of the buyer's inventory? Even though they didn't take physical what? Possession of those until January of the next year, at December 31st of the year that they purchased it, it is going to be included in what? In their ending inventory, even though they don't possess it yet. So what happens if the truck crashes? Fire comes up, the, the driver jumps out unharmed, okay? But the truck crashes and the inventory is destroyed. Who suffers the loss? The buyer, the buyer suffers the loss, right? Well, let's say that the customer is going to get a refund, but never mind. Um, that is if the... Um, that is if the seller had arranged the pickup of those goods. 
uh, Brianna. So if the if the purchaser had uh, if the purchaser had had arranged the pickup of those goods, this guy is his responsibility. If he's you know a raging alcoholic, I shouldn't make jokes about you know drunk and driving, but you know if he's not a very good driver or whatever, and he crashes the car off the edge, it's not the seller's fault. It's what. It's the buyer's fault. He should have hired a more careful person, right? Okay, if he's a reckless driver or whatever. So remember, it's not like when you order something from uh, Amazon and they make you pay the freight, okay? And they make you pay if the freight cost is this much, okay? But they're then arranging the person that will take it up, take, pick it up. So if they damage it and route, it's their fault, Okay, but usually when we talk in accounting and it's free on board shipping point, that signals to you that what? That the buyer paid the freight and the buyer arranged for that freight to be picked up. So this person is the buyer's agent, right? And if they mess up, then the buyer suffers the loss. Okay, so. When is the carrier liable? Well, I guess the carrier could be liable um, from a standpoint uh, if you hired this public carrier and now the, uh, the buyer could go after this person and sue them for the losses. But as far as the accounting that we're talking about between the buyer and the seller, the buyer is the one that is going to suffer the loss. And so they would sit there and have to basically say, well, that inventory is worthless now. We have a loss on the inventory. And if they want to go after the seller for, I mean, uh, now the, the uh, carrier for losses and damages, they can't. And we wouldn't be allowed to take that as a uh, recoup of our losses until we actually won the case. We have to have, we have a settlement agreement that they are going to pay. Uh, we do, in accounting, rule of conservatism, we don't take contingent gains, contingent losses only. Contingent means what? The uh, determination is, is predicated on some sort of, the, the outcome is predicated on a determination by a court or something like that. If the courts haven't decided yet, even if we're certain we're going to win the case. The guy was a horrible driver. He crashed the truck on purpose. We have a tape recording of him, you know, saying, watch me crash the truck. You know, <laughs> posted it on Facebook. And, and you could see our goods with a tumbling down the hill and getting destroyed there. Until we have been adjudicated as the winner of that case, we would not be able to put down that we're recouping that loss. Question? So you're saying that if the seller arranged for the uh, for the transportation for buyer to pay for it, it would be the seller's liability if it could happen? Yeah, if the seller arranged for it, which is really kind of outside, and I know we're used to you know most of our experience with this kind of stuff at this stage of our career is what? Well, I ordered a shirt and they shipped me the shirt. I had to, they said my shipping cost was $1.99 and all that. But from the standpoint of the, um, of the, from our accounting standpoint, if the seller arranged, uh, from a legal standpoint, the seller arranged for the, um, for the person to ship, then obviously, what are we, we're just sitting here waiting for it. How can we you know, suffer that loss? We'd send that back if they destroyed the goods or whatever. Okay. Now you could also have free on board destination. Free on board destination means that the when you see that term, that means that the seller paid the freight. And if the seller paid the freight, then what? Then the transportation cost is going to be considered freight out. And that is going to be considered an operating expense, a selling expense to the seller. Think about it for a minute. Let's say I wanted to buy this podium. I want to take it home so I can make speeches at home, okay? And I sit there and I go, man, I'd love to take this, but boy, this is a heavy thing. And so I sit there and I'm trying to figure out, do I want to take this thing home? And the seller comes up and says, we deliver, you know. Did you know we're delivering this week, right? Isn't that going to, what, facilitate the sale, right, if the seller pays the freight? So if the seller pays the freight, that is going to be considered what? An operating expense, a selling expense to the seller, okay? And that is when it's free on board destination. So if it's free on board destination and they ship the goods on, 
December 28th, I think was the date that I gave you for it. December 28th, they ship the goods, but the goods don't arrive until January. Then is that a item that's included in the buyer's ending inventory at the end of the year? It is not because what? Title doesn't pass until we actually receive the goods at the buyer's warehouse. This person now that's delivering the goods is the agent of who? Of the seller, aren't they? So title does not transfer until we actually receive the goods. So if we hadn't received the goods at the end of the year, then they're not included in our ending inventory. Then whose ending inventory would they be included in? They are still included in the seller's ending inventory, even though the seller may be in Florida and the inventory was in Nebraska at the end of the year. It's still considered part of their ending inventory because what? Title did not transfer free on board destination. It hasn't arrived yet at the buyer's warehouse. Therefore, it is still considered the seller's ending inventory. More importantly, from our standpoint as accountants, does the seller have a sale? Does the seller have a sale at the end of the year? The seller does not have a sale at the end of the year because what? The goods had to have been received by the buyer, right? And since they weren't received yet in that example, not only are those items included in the seller's ending inventory December 31st, the seller can book a sale until what? Until next year. Question? Okay, good. So just to see a couple of terms here, okay? If we have the situation, uh, listen. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. So like if you're, so we're talking business and business. So if you have a business and you pay like another business to deliver your goods, but you have to pay for them to deliver it, uh -huh. is that the seller that arranging the sale? Like the market, like a you mean the transportation? Yeah. If the seller arranges the transportation from a legal standpoint, they are going to be responsible, right? I mean, we can't be responsible when the seller is the one that so arranges. Like, how do we determine what we're paying for the, like, the goods? So, like, we're paying for them to deliver, but they're delivering it to us, and so we don't get. Title would not transfer until we actually receive the goods, okay? okay? Even though we're paying the freight, okay? Uh, when the seller arranges, so that would be like a free on board destination. However, since we're paying the freight, the freight is going to be considered freight in and it's going to be considered part of the cost of that inventory. Okay, so you could have a mixture, I guess. Um, I'm just trying to simplify it by saying who pays the freight. But if we did pay the freight, but the seller then hired the common carrier, etc., then if the stuff gets damaged in route or whatever, and we refuse delivery, that's on the seller and title doesn't transfer until we receive the goods as the buyer. However, if we paid the freight, we would add it to the cost of our inventory the way we're doing here. Okay, and that's considered freight in, okay? Um, if it is a situation where the seller paid the freight, then it is going to be considered a selling expense and there would be a debit to freight out. So here we're looking at a journal entry made by the buyer for the purchase of the inventory, debit inventory in, credit cash, I mean inventory which is freight in, debit the inventory, add it to the cost of the inventory. If what? If the seller pays the freight, it is an operating expense called freight out. Okay, but at the same time layered on top of that, you need to understand the terms what? Free on board shipping point, Free on board destination. Free on board shipping point means that what? Means that the buyer arranged for the shipping and their for transfer the title does not transfer until what? Our title transfers when the goods are picked up, as opposed to what? Free on board destination, meaning that what? Title did not transfer until we actually received the goods. So you gotta sort of know both of those things going on. And typically the way questions are written. They say that the seller is the one that pays the freight for a, for free on board destination. The buyer is the one that pays the freight for free on board. Huh? There's a liability shift if it's prepaid. Prepaid for advance. By? The buyer. If the buyer paid and the buyer arranged for the shipping, then the buyer would be the one that would suffer the loss. If I paid it because they told me I had to pay it, 
and they arrange, then if the stuff crashes, I don't have to take that loss as a buyer. Question? Um, I would imagine it depends on the not only the type of business but the nature of the transaction. I mean, we're sort of sitting here thinking about buying one shirt you know, or one couch or something, you know. But if we're sitting there and we purchase, you know, a whole shipment of coal, you know, and part of the deal is that we have to pay the freight and we have to arrange to get that freight to us, then that's where these terms, free on board destination, free on board shipping point, have a cleaner, you know, explanation the way we were just talked about. So I suppose it depends on the business. It probably depends on the volume of what we're purchasing, the traditions in the business, et cetera. So it could be a lot of things. Okay? Okay, good. So let's just go ahead then and let's take a look at purchase returns, okay? And uh, purchase allowances. But we're going to focus really on purchase returns here, okay? <laughs> And what happens? If you return an item because it doesn't meet your specifications, you ordered a white shirt and they sent you a black shirt, what would you do with that black shirt? You would return it. Would you still pay for it? No. So if there's a return, what happens? We are not going to consider ourselves liable to pay for that item anymore, but it's going to come out of our inventory, isn't it? Right? Because we won't keep it in our inventory. We're going to send it back. And so what happens? At the time that we return something, we debit the account's pay-up bill because we're not going to pay for that thing now. We're returning it, aren't we? And we'll credit the inventory to take it out of inventory because we don't want this stupid thing, right? We're sending it back. Okay. Now, you come over and um, you take a look at purchase discounts. Any question on returns? You blinked in this one. Paul, do you have a question? Why do you think? Well, if you send back a, somebody sent you a Giants hat, you ordered a Cleveland Indians hat, would you keep the Giants hat? Okay, so you're going to send the Giants hat back, right? And are you going to pay the bill for the Giants hat? So you debit accounts pay a bill because you don't owe that money anymore. You're sending the inventory back, right? And you reduce the inventory because you're sending the inventory back. So you have to credit that asset to send it back, right? Huh? Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa! Don't ever say that again. Sorry. You're not debiting. If you're debiting a liability, it is not increasing. Okay, never mind. You're you're so you're so, so yeah, sorry. No. Sorry, no, I'm like I, the, I messed up. I'm like the piano teacher, and you were trying to play, you know. Moonlight Sonata, and you can put it on note. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what you told me. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, so, <laughs> so what's happening? You're sitting here, and we're trying to do what? We're trying to uh, reduce the liability, right? Yeah. Because you don't know the guy? So we debit the account stable? Paul? Yeah. Is he, yeah. Okay, and we're crediting the inventory because we're sending the stuff back. We're reducing the asset, right? So if we take your cash, but it just ends up accounts we able to cash? If we had already paid the person cash, we would probably, you know, because it's not like we can say, poof, we sent the inventory back and we got the cash, so we might set up a receivable for the cash that's coming. But yes, eventually it would be a debit to cash. That's correct. So it would be accounts receivable for the Yeah, or refunds, receivable, or something like that on inventory, depending on how granular we want to get with our accounting for that kind of thing. Um, but commonly, and on your exam, I'll have a situation where it's just it's just the uh, inventory being sent back, and it was on an account, right? And so it's a debit to payable. Okay? Okay, good. Now you come over, and we have this idea of purchase discounts. What happens? Companies will give a discount if their client, their uh, customer, pays the bill early. Why would a company do this? 
to get the money, right? Maybe we've got a problem with our cash situation or something, and we come up with this scheme so that we will be paid what? So that we will be paid earlier. We're going to get the cash sooner, aren't we? Now, why would we regularly give people 30 days to pay us on our accounts, on our accounts uh, receivable? Why would we all of a sudden uh, be willing to tell them, well, just pay me, uh, uh, why would somebody be willing, I guess you'd say, to pay us earlier? We usually give them 30 days, now all of a sudden we're saying pay us early. So how are we going to entice them to do that? We'll, right, we'll give them a discount, right? We'll just go ahead and give them a discount, okay? And so when we have a discount, you need to know the how to read these terms, okay? So this is what? 2, 10, net 30. What this is saying, guys, you've got to know what this means. What this is saying is that we'll give a 2% discount if you pay us in within 10 days. Otherwise, you have to pay us the entire amount in what? 30 days. I don't know why they don't call it 210 gross 30. To me, would have been more descriptive because you have to pay the whole amount within 30 days, don't you? I can't tell you why, you know, Casey Oldie let them get away with calling it 210 net 30, but that's what they call it. 210 net 30. 2% discount if you pay in how many days? 10 days. Otherwise, you have to pay in how many days? 30 days. Okay. Now, there are other ways to communicate these discounts, guys. I'm going to hold you responsible for this first vernacular 210 net 30. Okay. Now, I could sit here and on your exam say 115 and 30. What does that mean? 1% within 15 days, or on 10 days, 30 days. Very good, okay. Uh, I could say whatever you said, right? I could say what? 210 net 45, got to pay me in 45 days, right? Okay, the typical one is 210 net 30. This is the setup. I don't know. I guess these other things are relevant, okay? Now, does this sound like something that should be played on the Who Cares channel all day? And all night, this 210 net 30 stuff. Brian, you're like, really? Really? That's what being an accountant's all about? Wars have been fought over the discount term. Billion dollar deals have fallen apart over what? Over the discount terms. Companies will fight each other to the death. You know, the corporate wars will be fought over this. Are they going to have corporate wars someday? You ever seen the movie Rollerball? You know what's movie Rollerball? Okay, don't see the new version, see the old version. The <laughs> one from the 70s. The premise of the movie Rollerball was that all the world's governments went bankrupt, and the only one left with any money were the corporations. That was the premise of the movie back in the 70s. And the way the corporations decided to settle their differences was by having wars. But then they saw that that was too destructive, so they invented this sport called rollerball. And they decided their differences through this game in which they played to the death. And it was dudes on motorcycles, some were on motorcycles, some were on skates, some were, you know, throwing ball at each other. And um, so you had a society that was sports obsessed, in which all the corporations held all the uh, money, and all the world nations were bankrupt. Anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting when I was thinking about that movie. I was like, hey, wait, wait a minute. minute. Huh? <laughs> oh, I think it's like considered a classic. It was remade. Yeah, I think it was pretty much considered. Huh? What's wrong with the new one? Well, you know, it, it's kind of like if you make a movie that's that good, just leave it alone. Just step away from the story. You don't need to try to improve on it. That's my point. But kind of like, anyway, stop. Forget I mentioned that. Cut. Okay. 210 net 30, right? 2% discount, okay? Uh, otherwise, the whole, if you pay within 10 days, otherwise, the whole amount has to be paid in 30 days, okay? Uh, so you come over and you take a look at the South Stereo, and they pay the balance due of 3500 for an invoice of which the gross price was. 3,800, but they returned what? They returned 300, didn't they? Right? So just to uh, 
go ahead and let's uh, let's tee it up on the board just so we're keeping track of this uh, inventory kind of as we go. Lisa's handouts. Okay, so we got one. Get your handouts still pretty deep there. Okay, and so we have what? We had the inventory account. And we originally debited for $3,800, did not we, when we purchased the inventory? Debit inventory, credit accounts payable. And then that inventory got sent back, didn't it? Some of it? $300, so we credited the inventory. So how much is left in the inventory account now? $3,500 is left in the inventory account, right? Okay. And so now we've got a bill of $3,500. Uh, let's just do accounts payable, too, at the same time. Accounts payable was originally what? 3800 we sent back 300 so the accounts payable is also showing 3500 right now, isn't it? Okay, we're gonna go ahead and pay the guy and we're gonna pay the guy within the discount period. So if we take that 3500, if we take that 3500, and we get a 2% discount, how much is our discount? Oh, for the original 3800 Yes, sir. Thank you. And then we debit it for the return, right? Yes. Thank you. So we got 3500 that we, oh, thank you. Okay, Jordy. So 3,500 times what? Times 0 0.02 is how much of a discount? $70. So we're going to get a $70 discount, aren't we? On this inventory? Because we're getting a 2% discount. So what's going to happen? The journal entry is first going to be the debit accounts payable for the full 3,500 because I'm paying the bill off. The guy said he would accept 2% less, didn't he? So do I owe him any more money? When I pay him this lesser amount, the seventy dollars less, this whatever it comes out to, thirty-four, thirty, right? Okay. And so what happens? I go ahead and I credit cash for the thirty-four, thirty. And what do I want to credit? I'm going to credit inventory because my inventory indeed is costing me less, isn't it? Why? Well, how much am I paying the guy? 3430. So when I go ahead and I credit the inventory for 70, does it come down to 3430? You come down to 40, 30, uh, 34, 3430? Yeah. You come down to 3430? How much did I pay him? How much cash did I pay him? 3430. Don't you love accounting? Look at that. What did you pay him? 3430. How much is the value of the inventory right now? 3470 less. 3430, right? Why would you sell me 70 less? It's 3430. It's looking right at you, right there, right? Alyssa? Well, so your inventory is like going down value because you paid less for it? Yeah. Okay. So you have the same amount of inventory, it's just worth less. No, no. I have what? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I have the same amount of inventory. I sent back that 300. That gave me less inventory, right? And then I was left with this bill of 3500. But the guy only says, "Well, you know what? <laughs> just, just give me 3430. We'll call it all even, right?" So I sent him 3430. I mean, he said it more formally than that. We would have agreed ahead of time to 1030. But once we had agreed to that and we went ahead and paid it, of course, we had to pay it within the 10 days, didn't we? In this example, they paid within the 10 days. So once they paid it within the 10 days, they go ahead and they credit the inventory for that lesser amount because they're paying less for it, right? Right? I'm debiting accounts payable for how much? In this example? How much am I debiting accounts payable for this example? Right there on the screen. I'm debiting the accounts payable for 3500 Is it zero now? Is it supposed to be zero? Yes. yes, it should be zero because the guy's not expecting any more money from me, right? 
in the cash of 3430. I just looked at Paul's face. Paul just fell in love with accounting just now. I saw it. I saw him going, oh, oh, oh. Right, Paul? Okay. Everyone will remember that moment. The moment that you fall in love with accounting, you'll be going, oh, so perfect. It's so beautiful. Okay? Question? Now, what happens? If you're in a situation where you don't pay within the discount period, how much money do you have to pay the dude? $3,500. Each debit account payable for $3,500. The inventory will still be showing $3,500 because that's what you paid for, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and they show us uh, the T account, guys, for the inventory. And the only thing is, remember there was that 150 freight in? It's different from what we have written up here on the board is what I'm saying the only difference is. Remember we paid 150 for the freight in? Remember we said it was freight in and we were supposed to do what? Add that to the cost of the inventory. Okay, so you have the original purchase price, purchase price less the returns. Have to add that freight in, and then what? And then you take off the seventy dollars for the two percent discount, right? Yes, sir. So for this John? example, can we see what the other person will look like? So the other yes. Like account receivable. Of you will percent. see it. Okay. It's coming. Stay on the range, cowboy. It's coming. <coughs> we'll, look, we'll look at it. And then when we look at the class example, we're going to look at it all kind of one sheet of paper. Look at the see the big picture. Um, What's hard to swallow is, let's say I get the inventory, but it's, to me it's worth <coughs> the profit margin as well, right? But then you record it at our cost. You record it at your cost, and then the difference between what you sell it for and your original cost, okay, let's just go back real quick. I don't know how quick it's going to be, but let's go back. Okay, which is what? That's the 3430, but we're going to sell it for 4000 so when we sell it, then we will be able to book the sale. When we report it on our financial statements, our gross profit will be the difference between the thirty-four, thirty, and the four thousand, which I want to go figure out in my head now. Let's say the five, six, five, seventy. And possible profit, possible goods sold is the cost of goods sold. Huh? The cost of goods sold is the. Oh yes, sir. Cost to get sold is directly related to inventory because when we sell the item, we're going to debit our cost to get sold and credit our inventory for our cost. At the same time, we'll debit probably account receivable and credit uh, sales for our sale price, right? Yeah. Okay. That's coming. Okay. Question on this one? Okay, so now let's go ahead and let's take a look at the um, sale of these of, of inventory. So when we sell inventory, we're going to do what? We sold it for thirty-eight hundred, and the inventory had a cost of what? The inventory had a cost of what? Twenty-four hundred in this example. Okay, so what are we going to do? Will debit accounts receivable credit sales for thirty-eight hundred? I just should have put the slide up when you asked me, right? We debit accounts receivable credit the sales for thirty-eight hundred. Debit what? Cost of goods sold and credit the inventory for twenty-four hundred, right? What costs are included in that cost of the inventory? Original invoice price plus what? Freight in minus any what? Returns minus any cash discounts, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over, and if the person pays within the discount period, how much cash are we going to get in that example? 3500 sale? After there had been the return and stuff. Same example assumes the return. I know we had set up a sale originally of 3800 but uh, I didn't put the return on there. We would have had the return of what? Of the goods that we had returned for 500 or that were returned for 500. So we would have done what? We would have debited sales and we would have credited the accounts receivable for the 500 because the guy isn't going to pay me the full, uh, what was it, 500 or 300? 300 that got returned? 
Okay, so there's 300 that got returned. So now we're paying 3,500, and we're going to pay that within the discount period. So since we pay within the discount period, will the guy be satisfied with 3430? Huh? Yeah. Or will we, or I shouldn't say will the guy, will we be satisfied? Now we're getting paid, right? So we're uh, satisfied for 3430. We accept that as payment. We credit the accounts receivable for the entire what? 3500 because we don't expect the guy to send me any more money now, right? We just sold it to him for 3500 and we're going to sit here and debit this account called sales discount taken. And they show you that that's a 2% discount right here. Sales discount taken is going to be an account that is a contra to sales. It is closed out to sales. So if I report my sales for the period, I'm going to go ahead and I gotta get my pen out. Anyway, we have sales of how much? How much were my sales in this example? Huh? Well, we start out with 3,800, but they returned 300. So let me just write that journal entry in there. So we debt originally had credit accounts receivable for what? 3,800 in credit sales for 3,800. But then remember, 300 got returned to us. So when 300 got returned to us, we would have done what? We would have debited sales for 300 and credited accounts receivable for 300 because if somebody returns stuff to us, we don't expect them to pay it for pay us for it anymore, and we don't have a full sale of 3,800, right? So sales was sitting there, net of the return of 3,500, and then the guy took our discount, didn't he? And so when he took our discount. We sat there with that 2% discount now on the next slide. 2% discount of what? Of $70, okay? So we debited what? We debited sales discount. How much are our sales right now? The sales are now what? 3,500, aren't they? And so we debited that sales discount credit account receivable. So when we report the sales, Sales are going to be 3,500 less what? Less the discount? How much is the discount? Discount is $70. Discount is $70. So our net sales is going to be 3430. How much money did we get? 3430? We're reporting our sales net of the discount, are we? Are we reporting the sales net of the discount here? Okay, so when we report our income statement, our sales less the discount, net sales is thirty-four thirty, which is what we got for it, right? That's the cash we ended up getting. Now let me ask you this. Would it have changed this net sales number if we would have just debited sales? If we had just debited sales rather than debit this sales discount number and take this approach, if we simply debited sales, our sales were sitting there at 3,500, weren't they? If we debited sales, what would our sales show? 3430, right? I mean, uh, excuse me, 30, yeah, 34, 3470, 3430, right? Right? So why didn't we just debit sales? Huh? No, because if we debit, if we had a return, we would have debited sales and returns. If we had a return, we didn't show re the return in this example. Oh, I guess I did. I debited sales, didn't I? Sorry, my bad. We should have debited an account called sales and returns. Sorry. We should have debited an account called sales returns. But why don't we just debit sales in both of those instances? Why do we have to have an account called sales discounts and an account called sales returns instead of just taking it straight to sales? Uh, it'll look like we just lost three hundred dollars of sales. It'll look like what? We just lost three hundred dollars of sales. Uh, we, we did lose those sales. 
So it should look like we lost them, right? So it's actually the mirror image of what you're saying, that if we put it straight to sales, it would look like we didn't lose the sales. We did lose the sales, right? Because somebody returned and people took our discount, didn't they? So you're on the right track in that what? If we put it straight to sales, we would lose the visibility as to what? How often people are returning our goods. Why would we want to know how often people are returning our goods? Why do we care? Huh? Okay, like what? Manufacturing problems, right. Maybe we make our stuff look really, really good on TV. You ever seen that thing where they sit there and you can do this and you lose weight? It looks great on TV. Then you get the thing home and it's like, what is this thing? Send it back. I'm not going to lose any weight on this thing. I didn't really buy that, but I'm just saying, obviously, right? I'm just saying that what you're sitting there and we're sitting there saying, geez, we have a lot of returns. We need to understand what it is about the actual good that once people get it, they don't like it anymore, right? Accounting will tell you that, right? How about our sales discounts? Why do we sit here and debit sales discount instead of debiting straight to sales? Paul? Maybe you want to stay on that. People are getting discounted. See if people are taking our discount. What happens if nobody takes our discount ever? Our sales discount is zero. That means it's not a very good discount. If you want to actually get people to take advantage of that discount, you need to sweeten it a little bit, don't you? Okay. What happens if everyone takes a discount? People are coming from out of town to take advantage of the discount, whatever. Now what? Man, maybe we can make that discount a little less uh, you know, attractive and still accomplish our goals of managing our cash, right? A little better. So you keep track of these accounts because, and this is the thing with, and the reason I'm saying this, guys, this may seem obvious to you, but this is the whole point of accounting. Accounting, you set up accounts, etc., to keep track of things that you want to keep track of, right? If you don't care about it, then you don't necessarily need an account for it, right? Okay. Okay, good. And you come over and uh, notice that we have what? Our net sales, our net of what? Our original sales revenue, less our what? Sales allowances and returns, which we had that $300 return. Less our what? Less our discounts, right? And that gives us our net sales. I will promise you that you will need to know this definition for your exam. When we take a look at the practice exam a little bit later, you're going to see that there's a lot of questions dealing with this. It is contra. It absolutely is. When I put an account against another account like that, that's a contra account. The way that shows right there is a contract. What does contract mean? Against, against right? Okay. <coughs> That's why you have contra cost accounting. Right? There's another cost. Okay? All right, good. Now we come over. Oh, and it said it right there. There was another slide, too. Is that why you asked me? Well, I'm not saying this. Oh yeah, sales discount too. Both of them are contra revenue. I think we should be able to fix the one on the board to sales discount. Well, that one was a discount. Oh, I see. Yeah, I didn't put it there. You're right. I don't know why I took that slide out. I should just leave the slide on, but we have to For some reason, I took it out. Okay. Closing entries, guys. Do you know how to do this? Do you know how to do closing entries? You know how to do closing entries, right? You are the, you are the master of the closing entries. You walk around campus like this, I got the closing entries. <laughs> hey man, you want some closing entries? Don't mess with me, right? You go, you kid, you know how to do closing entries? I didn't think so. Okay, any question on that? Okay. Um, let's do this. We are going to now look at the in-class example. We're going to keep going because I don't know where Jonathan is. 
And so we're going to keep going. And um, But I want to go to the in-class example, which um, is on this little handout that I gave you, that I'm going to give you. So go ahead and let that go around while I get the in-class example up. In my chapter four in class, example, I thought I had it. I guess not. Everybody got that thing? Everyone's got one? Would that be a yes or a no? Yeah. Everyone's got it? Okay. Okay, good. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look up here. And this is going to be, um, guys, like the... Uh, in class example that we had for chapter two and that it kind of everything was on that one example same kind of deal here now everything important from chapter four is going to be on this example okay so let's just go ahead and let's take a look and we just start out getting some cash into this company I want some cash in this company because I don't like dealing with no cash and so I debit cash is cash an asset so I debit the cash, 294000 It has a balance of 294 I credit the common stock, 294 When I credit the common stock, 294 does it have a balance of 294 mm -hmm. You've got to write that in, guys. If you see the, uh, the T account written in on there, you've got to write it in on your paper. On this one piece of paper I gave you, go ahead and write a T account for your uh, common stock, right? Just like it is up there. Common stock credit 294. Write it in. Write in common stock rate. 294,000 balance, right? Debit and cash. Credit to common stock. Posting. Do we just post this? Right? Okay, okay, good. Then we come over and we purchase some inventory. And when we purchase the inventory, we purchase it for 310,000. Terms are 210 net 30, right? That means we get what kind of a discount? 2% discount if we pay in 10 days after, otherwise we have to pay the whole amount in 30 days. Good, so we debit inventory. There's your inventory. See the debit inventory right here? See the debit to inventory right here? 310. Don't worry about this credit right now. Never mind the man behind the curtain. Pretend like it's showing 310 right now. Okay, I'm going to put that credit in in a minute. I didn't do this right. Don't worry about it right now. So right now, pretend that that balance is how much? 310. Because we debited 310. Don't worry about the credit yet. Just pretend that credit's not there. What do I tell you in accounting class? Don't use your imagination unless what? Unless I tell you to, and right now I'm telling you to use your imagination and pretend that that three chain say three ten. Okay. Now I debit the inventory. I credit accounts payable for three ten. Guys, you got to write that in, and I recommend you write that in right like I did under accounts receivable. You have an accounts receivable T account there on your paper. Huh? Write the accounts payable in right underneath that. Okay, so just go ahead and credit accounts payable for how much? 310? And it has a balance of 310? And right now, pretend like our inventory says what? 310. Right? Okay, good. Now we come over and uh, we have $10,000 return. 
we have a $10,000 return right here, don't we? So since we have a $10,000 return, debit accounts payable for $10,000 because we're not going to have to pay the guy the full $310 because we're returning some of that stuff, aren't we? So now the balance in accounts payable is how much? $300,000 is the balance in accounts payable. I go ahead and I do what? I credit the inventory for $10,000 because I'm sending that stuff back. Imagination meter is now off. What's the balance? 300,000, right? Is there a reason it's done in the same line? I messed up. I'm, you know, I'm doing an Excel spreadsheet, probably two o'clock in the morning. I just got home from the bar. No. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> you know, I just made a mistake. Right? It's because I thought I wrote it on this line that I wrote it there. I just get in a hurry. So. I, you know. The, these ex in class examples, as you can see, are not visions of you know good presentation here because uh, I just sometimes had trouble explaining things, and I just go ahead and just pump out an example for like one student that comes, and then after I look at, it, I'm like, oh, oh, so and so understood it after that. Let me show it to everybody, and so that's how the, usually these examples come to light. So, so I just made a mistake. I was in a hurry, and it was three hundred thousand. But it's 300000 now, right? So no, there is no reason other than my mistake. Okay, so then what? Then we're going to pay our payable within the discount period, right? So if we pay within the discount period, we get how much of a discount? 2%. So if you take the 300000 now, it's 300000 because we owe to return 10000 right? You take the 300000 times 2%, that means we're taking a $6,000 discount, which comes off the cost of the inventory, doesn't it? So when we go ahead and we credit now the inventory for six, now the inventory comes down to 294,000, doesn't it? Okay, now what happens? We go ahead and we're going to debit the payable for the full 300,000 because the guy's willing to take 294 cash with a 6% discount, isn't he? Right? And so what happens? We go ahead, we debit the payable for the full 300000 Is the payable zero now? So we pay that off, and of course, we have to do what? We have to credit the cash for the two ninety four. so we're back to zero cash now, are we? Could we credit the cash? Can we pay the guy 294 of cash? Yes. And so you credit the cash, you post it over there, now it's zero, right? Now the cash is zero. Okay. Now, um, you know, I keep showing you this sort of longer, I don't know if it's longer. I mean, if you need to know the amount of the credit to the inventory, you have to do it this way. But what if you were taking the exam and I just asked you what's the amount of, what's the credit to cash? Could you could calculate this another way? If I simply asked you the credit to cash in a question, what would you do? In other words, I just wanted to know the credit to cash. Now you could say, okay, 300,000 times 0 0.02, that's a $6,000 discount. After the discount, that means that I'm gonna to have to pay the guy 294,000. You could do that, couldn't you? Is there, huh? Is there a faster way to do it? You take the 300,000 and you simply do what? Multiply it by 0.98, don't you? You get the same answer? Yes. Okay, I'm just pointing that out to you um, so that you realize you don't always have to do it this way. Now, we had to do it this way for this question or whatever because we needed that $6,000 discount, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now, you come over and uh, we've got some inventory, don't we? Do you want to sell it? If you buy inventory and you're in business, you're going to sell it, aren't you? So we turn around and, uh, is it John or Jonathan? Which one is it? I'm ready. Did you change your name to John? <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, Ray. Um, I'm trying, but I'm, I'm, I'm just having trouble, but I'm going to keep trying. I'll have your name straight by June 29th. Okay, so what happens? We sit here. And we have what? We have, you asked me, Ray, 
uh, what happens when we sell it? And I said, we're gonna have an example where it's all on one page. Okay, so here we go now. We're selling it, right? And uh, the company sells some of that inventory that we just purchased and they sell it for 160,000 and it has a cost of 100,000. So what do we do? We debit the accounts receivable 160, we credit the sales 160 because we're selling it, aren't we? Why are we selling it for more than our cost? Because we need to buy a Porsche. I mean, you know, come on now. Okay, so what do we do? We go ahead and we debit the account receivable, we credit the sales, we debit what? Cost of goods sold for the original cost, we credit the inventory, right? Okay, now if you go ahead and you look at the posting of that whole thing, um, where's my sales, 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 do I have to write that in? Yeah, sales, write it in, there's the posting of the sales, that's that credit to sales 160, isn't it? You have to write that in. Credit to sales, 160, okay? And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to debit our accounts receivable. How much? There's the debit to accounts receivable, 160. That's already there. You didn't have to write in the, the debit to accounts receivable. You simply have to write in the credit to sales. You can write it anywhere. There's the credit to sales. What do we call this that I'm doing right now? I'm posting, right? We debited account receivable, we credit sales, didn't we? There's the credit to sales, write it in. And then we have the what? We have the debit to accounts receivable right there for 160. Samantha, pretend that 30 isn't there. Okay, because I wrote it on the same line because I was in a hurry that day that the student was in there. So it's just the 160, so pretend the balance is how much right now? 160, good, okay. Then what? Then I sold some inventory, didn't I? Did I sell some inventory? So remember, I had credited it for 6000 after the, um, the discount, and now I'm crediting it for 100 because I sold some, didn't I? I sold inventory for 160 but the cost of that inventory was how much? Cost of that inventory was 100000 so I had sat there and I had debited the cost of goods sold and credited the inventory for 100. Is inventory an asset? Yes. Did I just get rid of some? Yes. I just sold it, so I credit the inventory, and you saw that posting, and I debit to cost of goods sold, and my cost of goods sold is up here now. There's my debit to cost of goods sold right now, right? Right here, underlined in blue. That debit to cost of goods sold, cost of goods sold is now how much? Hundred thousand. We're simply posting, aren't we? Okay. So again, when I sell the inventory, when I have the sale, I go ahead and I set up my sale, set up my sale at whatever my sales price is, and then I set up my cost of goods sold, right? Okay. Now what happens? Now somebody returns the stuff to me. They don't want my stuff, so they return thirty thousand worth. So what do I do? I debit what? And not like I did up there where I got lazy and just debited straight to sales. I debit what? Sales return for 30. And I credit the account receivable for 30. Okay? Now, just to look at the posting, um, Samantha, now you see that the 30 is there. I don't know why I wrote it on the same line, but I did. There's the credit. Now it has a balance of 130, right? Yeah. Okay, and I did what? I debited my sales returns, and guys, you gotta write sales returns in. There is a sales return for 30,000, isn't it? I just debited it. Write that in, sales return gets debited for 30,000. Everybody still on board here? Anybody got thrown overboard by that last turn? Jordy? I just have a question. So revenue, sales, revenue. Sometimes you'll see people call it sales revenue. Okay, um, we had service revenue, sales revenue, service revenue means I provided a service. Sales revenue means I probably sold you some merchandise. And that's not written. It's not like they when you step into heaven, they say one question and you can come in. Is there a difference between sales revenue and service revenue? 
and you know only God know, you know will hear the answer to that. So it's not written in stone anywhere. But generally speaking, if you're saying sales revenue, that means you sold merchandise. If you say service revenue, that's obviously service. Okay. All right. Good. Um, come over then and take a look at the return, debit sales return, credit <laughs> accounts receivable. Guys, I backed into this number. Don't worry about where this number came from. But I know that what? I know that the cost of the item that I sold is less than the sales price, isn't it? So I got to put that inventory back at its cost, right? I put that inventory back at its cost. And so I go ahead and I debit inventory and I credit cost of goods sold because that stuff came back, didn't it? Notice it came back at a different amount than its sales price, less obviously, because I sold it for more than its cost, right? Right? Okay. So you come over and you look at the posting here. And in the posting, I go ahead and I debit my, well, I credit my cost of goods sold for the 18750 right here. That brings it down to what? 81250 And I go ahead and I did what? I debited my um, inventory because that stuff came back, didn't it? So I debited my inventory for the $18,750, right here. There's the debit, just posting, because that stuff came back, right? Okay, so my cost of goods sold is showing what? Net of the stuff that came back, and my inventory is now net of the stuff that came back, isn't it? Okay, okay, good. Now I come over, and... I want to get paid, don't I? Do I want to get paid? Mm -hmm. So now I offered a 2% discount, so these people pay me within the discount period, don't they? So since they pay me within the discount period, I will go ahead and I'll get less cash. I'll get what? I'll get 127,400. If you took 130,000 and divided by 0.98, you would get this 127,400, wouldn't you? But we're sitting here, we want to know what the amount of the discount is. So the way I showed it, 130 times 0 0.02 means there's a $2,600 discount. So I debit sales discounts taken, 26. I debit the cash for the total amount the person's going to pay me, net of the discount. And now we can go ahead and liquidate that entire receivable, right? Because the guy's paying me off for the receivable. And so you look at the posting on that now. And there's my what? There's my um, sales discount that said, believe it or not, that says sales discount, not sales piss count, whatever, discount, D-I-S, that's not a P, that's a C, sales discount. Yes, for a contra revenue account to decrease it, to increase it, you debit it. It's going to be contra the sales, which is the credit, right? So I go ahead and I debit that for $2,600. There's that debit to sales discount. I'm, I'm debiting it now, right? Okay. And I go ahead and I did what? I debited my cash, didn't I, for the $294? Uh, I mean, for the $127,400, excuse me, net of the discount? Right? And Samantha, what should I credit? I'm asking you because it's that same thing. Why did you write them both on the same line? My account receivable now gets credited for 130. So is it now zero? It's now zero. Okay, now that I'm thinking back, maybe the reason it's on the same line is I probably thought of the discount after I had started the problem. And so I just, and I had already taken out the 130. And then I said, oh, I want a discount on there. So that's probably why I went ahead and put it the 160 and then put the discount in. I don't know. I don't know why. But it's it's now zero, isn't it? Because I paid it off. Yeah. Right? Okay. Okay, good. So I got paid, didn't I? Okay, now just to kind of get us back to a couple things from chapter two and I guess three, we have to take our rent expense. Okay. So assuming we had a store or warehouse or something. So we debited rent expense 15000 
And then, and not related to the rent expense, I just went ahead and said, and we had uh, interest expense of 1150 So this is taking us right back to the earlier chapters, isn't it? Okay. Okay, so with all that now, we should be able to prepare our income statement. Okay, and it might help you to look at your, uh, your page as we go through. But you can see that we have our sales is 160 isn't it? Isn't the easy part generating the financial statements, guys? You just take the numbers that are sitting in the ledgers and put, uh, put them into your financials, right? So we have sales of 160 We had what? We had the sales returns of 30 We had the sales discount of 2600 So our net sales is 127400 Right? Okay. Then we start to calculate our gross profit. So our net sales minus our, there's our cost of goods sold was 81500 after we put back that 18750 for the return. There's my cost of goods sold. Difference, uh, Peter, between net sales and cost of goods sold is gross profit, isn't it? Are we happy with this gross profit? That looks like a pretty good number to me. Why do we care? <coughs> about this person's gross profit. Why are we presenting our financial information so that someone can sit there and say, there's your gross profit? Huh? Huh? Yeah, I think we're on the right track. We can make money, continue business. Look, if this guy has a razor thin gross profit, there's not going to be much left over for any mistake in terms of what? How much they pay for their rent or anything like that, right? Whereas if this guy's core, what he does, she does for her business, there's still a nice chunk left over, we're pretty happy, aren't we? We're thinking, hmm, this, this cat's got a good business going on. You know, they've got a pretty good chunk of money left over when they're done, right? Can you think of a way of representing that to give us an even more... Uh, Enlightened picture of this, huh? An analysis. Yeah, right. We're going to do our gross profit percentage, yeah. right? So, what? How are we going to do that? Um, well, it'll just be the your gross profit uh, divided by sales, which tells you how much of your sales you converted to. Beautiful. Good job, man. Right? 46,150 divided by what? Net sales, guys. Net sales. We don't calculate it off of. You can see, hey, all this means is, you know, there was a mistake in the order. And all this means is, hey, we wanted to get a cash discount. In fact, entities often just start with the net sales and don't even show you these little pains of discount and gross and uh, returns. Okay? But, um, so we use the net sales of 127,400. Does that give us a percentage? What do you get? All those, please. I should get that one of the little whistles. Huh? 36.22 percent? Is that good or bad? Well, if you're taking a test, that's horrible, right? But if it's what? If it's a gross profit percentage, that's not bad. That's okay. Depends on the industry too, doesn't it? I mean, if we're selling gold, this is horrible. I mean, what in the, on earth is going on, right? Okay, but if we're selling t-shirts, that's not bad. Okay? Okay, good. So we come over and we're sitting there. We have our gross profit and then we do what? Then we start taking on, and that says less operating expenses. And notice, guys, remember our expenses, remember our rent? The only expense that's showing up as an operating expense is rent. Interest is not an operating expense. Why not? Huh? Because you have to pay the car with um, hmm, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so what? 
Say that again. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, I'm because I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun of you. I'm just like that is the way of looking at it. it. I mean, the interest you have to pay if you buy this from production. No, it's not a sunk cost necessarily. No, sunk cost is a cost that is not part of my analysis. Sunk cost is a cost that I can't cha I can't change it. It's gone. I can't change it. Rent <laughs> expense is not a sunk cost because I could just rent another building or something, right? So rent expense is ne not considered a sunk cost necessarily. Huh? Uh, interest expense, um, yeah, if I'm stuck paying, it could be a, a sunk cost. But I don't want to get into the managerial class. That's, <laughs> that's not what we're doing. I can teach it, but I don't want to do it right now. Oh, OK, let me just give you the answer. Maybe I've gotten all screwed up in what I want to say. Okay. <laughs> So what's happening? If it's if, if 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 it's a cost that is central to my business, right? Like rent, then it's considered an operating cost. Interest is not my core business unless I'm what? If I'm a bank, then I might report interest expense as an operating expense, right? But typically, and in this class, since we're not specializing in bank accounting here. For what? For manufacturers, for retail entities, interest is considered not operating, right? So things that are core to my business, my salary expense, my rent expense, things that I have to do to have my business, those are considered operating expenses, and they do not have to be sunk. Okay? They may be fixed, but they're not sunk. Salaries? Where do salaries go when they die? When they expire? They are a salary expense. The only thing that's a, it's still an expense, it's still an expired cost, but we call it cost of goods sold is the cost of the inventory. Okay, so it behaves like an expense, but we don't call it expense, we call it cost of goods sold. Because it hasn't really expired, it's now in the hands of somebody else, I guess. I don't know why they call it cost of goods sold, but they do. Okay? Whereas what? Expenses are expired. Salaries have expired because the person already did the work for us, right? Rent expense is expired because that month has already gone by, right? And rent may be a fixed cost. It's, it, it, rent typically is considered a fixed cost, as you've seen in the managerial class. But we're not teaching managers. Stop, John. Okay? And then what? We have our operating our operating items, our non-operating items, and the difference is what? Net income. Okay? What I'm showing you here, guys, is something called a multiple step income statement. And we're going to look at the detail of how a multiple step income statement works here in a minute. But notice the multiple steps, which is what? Sales minus returns and discount give us what? Net sales minus our... Cost of goods sold gives us our gross profit minus operating expenses will give us our operating income or loss minus our non-operating items give us our net income. Okay, and then you see the balance sheet here, guys. I'm not gonna you know bore you with the pulling of the. Um, of course, if we use boring you as a criterion, we blend the class. Not okay, but uh, I'm not gonna go through the detail of the TDM of pulling all of the balance sheet accounts to the. To the balance sheet. I think you can figure that out on your own, right? Question? Okay, good work, guys. So, I don't know, maybe Doton's sitting out there is thinking he can't come in and interrupt me. I have a feeling that's the case. So, let's go ahead and let's take the break right now. Let's do uh, 10 minutes and we'll come back and we'll look at the uh, quiz questions for chapter four. By the way, I think you're noticing now the pattern. I give you the quiz points. If you were here and you kind of participated and you're not just completely disrespecting the process, I'm giving you the quiz points. I'm giving you the homework points, right? Okay. So we'll continue that process. We'll go ahead and we'll jump into the, uh, the quiz when you come back. I'm going to start from here. Okay. Any question on that? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Grayson Manufacturing purchased switches and an invoice price of 
4,000 terms were 210 net 30. So you need to know that that's a 2% discount if you pay within 10 days. Otherwise, you have to pay the whole amount in 30 days. Half the switches were returned immediately. So what happens? We originally set up the accounts payable for 4,000 and debited the inventory for 4,000. See the posting? See the posting? If half got returned, then we would have debited accounts payable for 2,000 credited the inventory for 2000 so we end up with this $2,000 balance sitting there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, then what? Then they say that they paid the remaining invoice within the discount period. Well, if you pay within the discount period, then it would be 2000 times 0 .02. There's a $40 discount, isn't there? So I went ahead and I just wrote in the journal entry here, debit accounts payable for the full 2000 to liquidate it credit cash for the cash price net of the discount, and we take the what? $40 out of inventory, don't we? Right, because we paid less for that inventory. So it says what should be uh, to, if Grayson pay the remaining amount of the invoice, what should they pay? They're gonna pay what? 1960 of cash, aren't they? Right, now remember I told you, hey, you don't have to sit here and do all this if you realize and if you get a 2% discount, that's 0.98, that's 1960. If you're gonna only have an hour and a half to work that exam on Friday, you might wanna to start to work with some things like that. Okay. Okay, good, come over, let's take a look at number six. What amount of the following, which was it, number six? Which of the following is shown on the multiple step income and not the single step? income statement. So I guess I better tell you what that is, huh? So let's go ahead and let's go back to the slides, okay? And guys, I'm gonna, I guess I can put it in slideshow mode. Slideshow from current slide. Okay, and uh, let's take a look at multiple step versus single step, oops. And um, so here's the single step, okay? And with the single step income statement, what we do is we glom all of our things that increase our net income into one category on the single step income statement. So notice we've got revenues, will, that in will sales increase my, um, increase my in net income? Huh? Sales will increase my net income, won't they? Will interest revenue increase my net income? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it will because I'm doing what? I'm <laughs> sitting here and I'm um, having it revenue, right? Then we take all the things that will decrease my net income. For example, my cost of goods sold, operating expenses, interest expense. So we're not grouping them into their operating or non-operating components. We're just grouping them into whether they're pluses or minus. See the big plus and the minus? Mm -hmm. And so my net income is how much? 31,600, right? Question? What is that um, category? I'm, I'm Casual I'm loss from vandalism? Somebody comes in and <laughs> smashes my plate glass window with Mickey Mouse figures <laughs> and breaks my poor little Mickey Mouse figures, right? Well, I lost, didn't I? Am I in the business of having stuff destroyed yes. by vandals? No. Uh, I don't know what kind of business that would be. No, so that's, you guys are weird. No, there's no business where things are destroyed. For, for example, if I just saw that, like, last year, you know, I was going to have to own a few more of the classes, but it was going to have to quit. Because of the protesters and stuff, that's a loss from vandalism, and it's not part of a normal course of business. I mean, that's bad things. That, that's not... Hey, you know, you're the one who decided to put your business there. You know, they don't look at it that way. We take a loss because it's not the normal course of business. Starbucks business is brewing you horrible tasting coffee and selling it to you, right? That's their business, not getting their stuff smashed. Sorry, I'm not Pete's guy. Okay, so we have what? We have our revenues, our expenses, but right now, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Grace. Right now, the whole thing is that all the pluses are together, all the minuses are together, right? Okay. Now, when you come over and you look at the, in fact, I don't know why they don't call the single, the single step the two step. One, two. 
But if they called it the two-step, the country western people would get upset with them. So they just call it a single step. Okay? Ha 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 ha! That was everybody laughing at that joke. Okay, so you come in there and you have what? You have the multiple step, okay? And the multiple step, you already know how to do. You already know how to do the multiple step, which is what? You take your operating items, which is your sales, less your what? Less your returns and allowance gives you what? Net sales minus your cost of goods sold gives you your gross profit. You take off your operating expenses, and you then have your income from operations, operating income, whatever, right? Hello? Uh -huh. An allowance is if we decided that we were going to return something and instead of getting our money back, they just said, okay, you've got a credit here with us that you can use later. And so we wouldn't necessarily wait for the cash to come back. Uh, we would just go ahead and have a credit with them. Don't worry about that. We're just worrying about returns here. No, no, no. I give expensive. them the item back, but now I have a credit at that store. So. Yeah, that's called an allowance. Okay. okay, but just worry about returns. Okay, so for returns, come off, and then we have our net sales, cost of goods, solar operating expense. That gives our operating income. And then, guys, we have these other revenues and gains. And notice they're calling that what? Non-operating, right? And notice we have interest revenue, interest expense that you've already learned about. Right? And then what? Then you come down. Grace, see the casualty law from vandalism? They're putting it down as non-operating. Mm -hmm. Having your stuff smashed in vandalism is not a normal part of operations, okay? Having an earthquake knock down your building is not part of the normal operations, right? Okay. Then what? Then we have this gain on disposal. A plant is up there as a non-operating item as well. Are we in the business of selling our plant assets? No. If we're Starbucks and we decide to sell all of our coffee makers, whatever, our coffee grinders, we're not in the business of selling coffee grinders. We're in the business of what? selling brewed coffee, aren't we? So we would take that gain when we sell something like a piece of equipment and we report that as a non-operating item. It's non-operating, because we're not in the business of selling our equipment, right? Question? Okay, so let's go ahead then. And that whole thing was seen in presenter mode, sorry for you fans watching at home. Okay, but let's go ahead and let's take a look at the question that we were looking at, which was chapter four. Which of the following is shown on the multiple step income statement, but not the single step? And the multiple step showed us what? Sales minus sales returns minus discount gives net sales, net sales minus cost of goods sold gives gross profit, right? Whereas with the uh, single step, they just grouped all the revenues and gains together, all the expenses and losses together, and didn't have those little stopping points, did they? So the answer is what? Gross profit? Okay. All right, good. Uh, net sales was there. Where'd you go, net sales? Where'd you go, slides? I mean. Single step had net sales. It started with net sales. Okay, so you're not going to derive net sales on the face of it. You're going to start with net sales. In fact, even frankly in the multiple step, you just start with net sales. A lot of companies won't even bother to talk about discounts and sales. FASB does not get all up in our face and say, okay, this is exactly how you have to make your income statement look, okay? And so, um, so you could still just have net sales. You don't have to show those back offs. But gross profit is something that you would always have on there in the multiple step. Okay, what are we talking about now? Question, uh, the quiz. Oops, not that one. It is going to be chapter four, this one, if I can get to it. 
chapter 4, this one. Okay? All right, good. Um, take a look at number 7. During 2013, Parker Enterprises generated revenue of 60. The company's expenses were as follows. Cost of goods, 30. Operating expenses, 12. And a loss in the sale of equipment of 2. Parker's income from operations, and I just wrote it up in the multiple step form, revenues minus cost of goods sold is gross profit minus the operating expenses gives us our operating income, right? We did not include the sale on equipment because that is non-operating. We're not in the business of selling our equipment, right? Okay, number eight. Conard Company reported the following balances at June 30th, 20. 13 sales uh, what is the net sales sales minus the sales returns and allowances right is the net sales yeah. okay and then you back off what cost of goods sold that gives you gross profit and you should learn from this question that you may also see the term gross margin in places gross margin and gross profit are synonymous terms Okay, good. Using the same facts, what is the gross profit margin ratio? And uh, thanks to Peter, we had that question, right? Or who? Who did that? Oh, pa, uh, pa, uh, Pius did that one for us, which was the 5,200 gross profit divided by the net sales, right? And notice it was net sales. Okay, good. Sales revenue less cost of goods sold is also called... Gross profit. Do you think you need to know that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this one. Glenn Company purchased inventory at an invoice price of 7000 Credit terms 210 net 30 What is the net cost of goods sold if Glenn pays within the discount period? And um, it's going to be what? Well, we paid 7000 for the stuff. If we got a 2% discount, Net of the discount, that stuff cost us 6860, right? Yeah. So when we sell it, we'll debit cost of goods sold 6860 in credit inventory. So that question was a little tricky, and that you're thinking, gee, shouldn't you be asking me what's the amount of the inventory? In effect, I am by asking you what? The cost of goods sold, because they're opposite sides of the same journal entry, right? Okay. Okay, good. Costner Market recorded the following events involving a recent purchase of merchandise. Received goods of twenty thousand, two tens net thirty. Returned four hundred. Paid a hundred dollar freight on the shipment and paid the invoice within the discount period. So let's just go ahead and do this. Debit the inventory to uh, twenty thousand credit accounts payable, right? And if you look at my accounts payable, I teed it up down there. There it is, twenty thousand, right? Then what? Then they, and there's my inventory, 20,000. Then they went ahead and they returned the stuff, 200, 400 of it. So they debit accounts payable, 400. And they do what? They go ahead and they credit the inventory, 19,600, right? I mean, 400 to bring it down to 19,600. Now you look at this, and where I have a lot of students made a mistake on this question over the years is that. They want to compute the discount on the uh, freight. Freight is not part of the discount. It's just the invoice price, right? The freight is what we pay that party that we arranged to go and pick the stuff up for us, right, when we paid it. So since we paid $100 freight, I go ahead and I do what? I add that to the cost, $19,700. So it's $19,700 so far, right? Right? Then since they tell me that I pay within the discount period, the discount period, guys, is on what I owe, not the freight amount. The freight is pretty much paid in cash, isn't it? So I take that 19600 times what? Times the 2% um, discount, 19600 Where's my calculation of 19600 times 2%? Huh? It's in red. Where? Right there. Where's the 2%, huh? It's 0.98 right there. 9,600 times. Yeah, but I didn't show you how to get the 392. Okay, so 19,000. Is it? 
Under cash. I think that's what she meant. Under cash? Yeah, but I didn't show you the calculation, okay? So the calculation, I'll just put over here, uh, is going to be, and remember guys, these things I put up here while I'm talking to the class, so I might have written on the board in that class. 19,000, what is it, 600? Times a 2% discount. 19,600 times 0 0.02 should be 392. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. That's 392, right? So that's the discount on the inventory. So we go ahead and we did what? We discounted the inventory 392. Okay, so when you look at the whole journal entry here for the payment, we debit the accounts payable 19,600. That liquidates that. We credit cash for what? 19,208, which is the 19,600 minus the what? Minus the 392 gives me the 208, doesn't it? <coughs> right? And then I do what? I credit the inventory for the 392 because I'm sitting here and I'm paying it less the discount, right? Okay? So when I credit the inventory for the 392, the cost of the inventory comes to 19,308. And I'm showing you that you could have also gotten it by saying 20,000 minus the 400 you return, minus the discount on the inventory gives you 19,208, add the freight, that gives you the 19,308, if you don't want to do it in a T account. And so that's how we end up with what? The answer, 19,308. I'm just curious, so there's an inflation of like 2%, could you still multiply by 0.98, but then just add it? Is that what you yeah, did? that's what I did down here, because there was a discount, no, there was a discount, of 2%. So I showed you another way to do it right here, which is to take the 20,000 minus the 400 that got returned. That was 19,600. And then 19,600 times 0 0.98 gives you 19,208 plus 100 is the 19,308, the red. This is another way to calculate it. So I'm just showing different ways to calculate this, right? You could do it the journal entry way, doing it like this. You could do it this way if you wanted, right? Question? Grace? Huh? I'm sorry, say that again. The hundred dollars is the cost of the freight, so that put it in nineteen thousand seven hundred, right? Mm -hmm. Now I just have to get the discount, don't I? Because I have to take that three ninety two discount out. Why don't I have a discount on the freight? Because that's the rules. Anything, any cost that you pay to get your assets to where you can use them are part of the cost of that asset. And so because you had to pay the freight to get that asset to where you could use it in your business, that's part of the cost of the inventory. Freight in is part of the cost of the inventory, right? Right? So they paid the freight. They incurred freight cost of $100. And so they went ahead and they included that $100 on the cost of the inventory. But the real takeaway from this question here is that you know, you got to be careful. You don't calculate the discount on the 19.7. You calculate the discount on the what? 19.6, don't you? Because you got to pay the freight guy. You got to pay him cash. You're paying him or her cash, and now your your deal for the two percent is with the vendor, right? And you owe the vendor 19.6. You owe the vendor 19,600. That's what you owe the vendor, right? Look, 20,000 was what you bought the inventory for. You debited the inventory 20,000. You credited the account payable 20,000. You returned 400, didn't you? So when you returned 400, you debited the accounts payable, you credited the inventory for 400. That's the vendor. How much do you owe the vendor? You owe the vendor 19,600, right? And the vendor's sitting there saying, oh boy, Grace is going to pay me $19,600. I can't wait. 
So she pays me that 19,600, right? Then here comes the truck driver. Uh, okay, I uh, got the goods here now. Uh, give me a hundred dollars, and we'll call it even. You give the truck driver a hundred dollars, don't you? Truck driver going straight to the bar with that hundred dollars. We never hear from him again, right? But now the vendor is still sitting there saying, nineteen thousand six hundred, please, unless you pay me within the discount period, right? And you say, okay, I'll pay you within the discount period. So we take the nineteen thousand six hundred, right? Where I write that. In green. 19, thank you. 19,600 times 0 0.02 is a 392 discount, right? Mm -hmm. So I go ahead and I reduce the inventory by the 392 because they're not going to pay you the full 19,006. If you want to look at it from a journal entry standpoint, I debit my accounts payable. 19,600, that liquidates that. I go ahead and I uh, debit the uh, credit the cash for the 19208 and again I'm saying 19208 is the 19,600 times the 0 0.98 19208 that I'm going to pay the guy I credit the cash for that and I credit the inventory for the discount which is what I wrote up on the board right that's the journal entry approach but since they're asking you what is the value of the inventory I'm saying you could have said 19,600 times 0 0.908 means I paid 19,208 for the inventory plus the Freight is hundred dollars. That would have been the nineteen thousand three hundred eight, right? Ray Company made a purchase of merchandise on credit from Tyree Corporation, August for seven thousand. Turned for two ten net forty five, and on August tenth, Ray made the appropriate payment. I don't like this question. I don't like this question because. You're supposed to figure out that what between August 3rd and August 10th is what is within the discount period. I guess yeah. I should have just told you. You shouldn't have to be sitting here counting how many days, <laughs> right? Okay. But what happens? We go ahead and we debit the accounts payable for the full amount. We credit cash for the discounted amount, don't we? And we credit the inventory for the difference. Two percent of seven thousand is one forty. Okay, so we're done with this test. We can do something else. When you pay it, if you return it, you can reduce your accounts payable and when you pay it, right? Yeah. Here, we went ahead and paid it off the full 7,000. We credited the inventory because the guy let us take a net of the discount, right? 7,000 times 2%. So we're done with this test? I can stop this now since you're all falling asleep on me. Okay. So when you start falling asleep, I stop, I stop showing it to you. Okay. You sure? Okay. Then let's go ahead and let's take a look at... the classified balance sheet. Now for you, that classified balance sheet is at the end of chapter three. I just stuck it here since we hadn't gotten to it yet. So if you look at the chapter three slides, um, they, uh, you wanna pick it up where they start this right here. So this is under chapter three. I just stuck it here on chapter four because we hadn't gotten to it yet in chapter three and I wanna do it now. These slides are at the end of chapter three slides. At the end of chapter three slides, okay? I just stuck them here so I don't have to open a new file. But it's the end of chapter three that we're looking at now. And we're talking about a classified balance sheet, okay? And when we talk about a classified balance sheet now, we classify our balance sheet as to whether our assets and liabilities are current or non-current. Current means that they will likely be used up within a year or the operating cycle of the company, whichever is longer. So for our purposes in this class, we'll say that a current asset will be used up in one year. So will the cash in your wallet be used up within one year? Yes. 
Yes. Yes, it will. It will not be there. Now you'll say, well, I'll still have $100, but not that $100. You'll have another $100. So the cash that you have on hand at any point in time is a current asset. A receivable is a current asset because what? You're pretty much going to collect it in, what, 30 days. In fact, you're encouraging people to pay you within 10 days, aren't you? Okay. When we talk about our non-current items, our long-term items, that is typically items that will still be around in a year. Will your building still be around in a year? Yes. Yeah. It will, unless there's some sort of horrible earthquake or something to knock it down. But we assume your building will be there in a year. Will your equipment be around in a year? Most likely it will. So property, plant, equipment is considered what? Long term. Now, when we talk about investments, we group investments into long term or current depending on management's intent. So if management's intent is to hold that thing for a long term, then it is a long term. If management's intent is to liquidate that investment soon, then it's going to be what? It's going to be short term. It'll be current. Okay? Okay, same thing with our liabilities, current and non-current, okay? So you look at this classified balance sheet now, guys, and you can see that a lot of the items that we're talking about have been grouped into the current versus non-current. Insurance prepaid, all of your prepaids are typically considered non-current because they'll probably liquidate within a year or so, right? Huh? Did I say non-current? Did I say non-current for prepaids? Excuse me, prepaids are, thank you, are current, not non-current because they'll liquidate within a year. Okay, long-term investments, right, stock investments, our property, plant, and equipment, land, equipment. Remember, we have our contra asset of accumulated depreciation, right? We're not going to talk about intangible assets yet, even though they're showing that here. Our liabilities, current and non-current. Now, notice something here. Notes payable can be current or non-current depending on what? Time. Huh? The time to maturity, right? Okay. The what? The, um, where is it? What was I looking for here? The mortgage payable. Remember, more means what? Death. Yeah. So let's hope that's a long term, right? Okay. Then we have our stockholders' equity, which we said is common stock and retained earnings several times. <laughs> yes, sir. So for the mortgage table, for example, like the whole like mortgage is a long term liability, but then some of it's going to be due currently. You have mm -hmm. to like break that up into like, yes. Put it all current in. portions of long term debt should be reported under current assets. So, for example, if I know that next year I'm going to pay off a hundred thousand, well, what's the total mortgage? Is that ten thousand? If I'm going to pay off a thousand dollars of that next year, then part of that mortgage payable would be classified up into non-current, I mean current, and the remainder would be down to non-current. That's correct. Okay. Questions? The correct order presentation and classified balance sheet is going to be okay. You report the items in order of liquidity, how quickly they'll be turned to cash. So how quickly is cash going to be cash? <laughs> so it comes first. How quickly is accounts receivable going to be cash? Pretty quick. How quickly is inventory going to be cash? We hope pretty quick unless we got a bunch of junk inventory, right? If that's the case, we should probably be writing it off. And then what? Prepaid insurance will never be cash again, will it? Right? It's going to become an expense, but then it'll never be cash again. Okay? Okay, good. Long term investments are considered long term. Based on what? What's management's intent? How do you, if you were auditing this company, how would you figure out management's intent? Huh? Ask. Ask them, right? And then what? When it comes to management's intent, when it comes to whether they're classifying an asset as current or non-current, we actually make them put that in writing. We call that a management representation letter. 
and we make them put that in writing to us with their intent. But it's all about their intent. Okay, property, plant, and equipment, I think you know. Wait, so like, if they don't write it, it's just assume that it's short then, or? No, I'm talking about from an auditing standpoint, mm -hmm. in rules of evidence, in auditing. In uh, auditing, we have to get what they call a management representation letter, mm -hmm. and we have to get that at the end of the audit, and we make them put down all things that they have simply told us verbally, we make them put it in writing. So really, mm -hmm because this is all determined off of management's intent. If I was trying to audit them, since there's no real way unless I had a mind reader mm -hmm. to see whether or not they should intend to hold it to long term, I would just go ahead and I would uh, have them put it in writing to me. It gives me a little stronger evidence. Mm -hmm. In the world of auditing, you have direct personal knowledge is the best evidence. The next best evidence is external evidence which comes from outside of the entity, obviously. Really? External comes from outside? Okay, and then we have what? Then we have uh, internal evidence. And when we look at our internal evidence, it's either going to be documentary evidence or oral evidence. Oral evidence is the least persuasive. And they tell us that you can't rely purely on oral evidence for anything. So when it comes to intent, and all you have is their testimony, you need to get some documentation and you get that from something called management representation. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm only throwing that out because you say, really, management just decides? Yeah, it's their financial statements. They decide whether they want to classify as current or non current. Okay. And then we have our property plan. Okay, current liabilities, guys, and long term. I'm not gonna go on about this stuff. Okay, so one of the um, calculations that we have is something called the current ratio. Current ratio is going to be current assets divided by current liabilities, right? We want this number to be greater than one, don't we? Yeah. If this number is less than one, what does that mean to us? That means this company's in trouble. They are not going to be able to meet their current obligations, are they? So the bigger this number, the better? Yes. Wait a minute now. If that number gets too big, what? Why aren't they putting those current assets to use? Why are they hoarding their cash? What's going on, right? Now, you know, when the financial crisis was hitting, a lot of companies were what? hanging on to their cash because they didn't want to throw it into something that was going to go in the ditch, right? So you might have a justification for that, but it certainly would draw your attention if that number got to be 80,000, you know, 80,000 to one. You'd be like, okay, what's going on here, right? So we want the number to be positive, I mean, excuse me, uh, greater than one, but not too, too much greater than one. And then again, it depends on the industry, right? Okay. Okay, good. Good, so we've got 10 minutes to get through chapter 5. That should be fun. Okay. Um, <coughs> chapter 5, and again, I was in presenter view. Just, you can still see the slides, it just looks funky. Okay, let's go ahead and let's pause this thing for a minute.